Let's talk about the real Jesus this morning. If you would like to follow me, it uh, will be reading in Hebrews chapter 1 and a little in chapter 2 as well. We'll also put everything on the screen for you. I wonder if you know the most well-known, the most popular person in the United States of America. Do you know who he is? He happens to be the one and only Jesus. He is without question more popular than anyone else in America. But at the same time, this same Jesus is amazingly misunderstood and an understanding of him truly as he is is not often found in the culture of which we live. For example, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, Paul the Apostle talks about people who have embraced another gospel and what he calls another Jesus. Notice, for if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Uh, the point that I want to make based on this verse is that even in the first century, toward the end of the first century, there was a lot of confusion and distortion over the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And it's certainly very true in our day as well. For example, I like how a gentleman by the name of Kevin DeYoung he has broken down a variety of ways that people see Jesus in our day. Uh, let me read the introductory paragraph. He says, the greatness of God is most clearly displayed in his son. And the glory of the gospel is only evident in his son. That's why Jesus' question to his disciples in Matthew 16 is so important. Who do you say that I am? The question is doubly crucial in our day because no one is as popular in the U.S. as Jesus. And not every Jesus is the real Jesus. And then he kind of breaks it down a little bit to help us understand what he's getting at. For example, he talks about the Republican Jesus who is against tax increases and activist judges, who is for family values and for the owning of firearms. And then there is the Democrat, Jesus, who is against Wall Street and Walmart for reducing our carbon footprint and for printing money. And they've done a lot of that in the last few years, I might add. Then there is the therapist, Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. And then there is the Starbucks Jesus <laughs> who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid and goes to film festivals. Very true, very true. Uh, then there is the touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of Super Bowls. There's gentle Jesus who was meek and mild with high cheekbones, long flowing hair, walks around barefoot wearing a sash looking very German. Um, there's open-minded Jesus, who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are not as open-minded as you. <laughs> you know the routine. There's the guru Jesus, a wise, inspirational teacher who believes in you and helps you find your center. 
Then there's hippie Jesus, who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagines a world without religion, and helps us remember that all you need is love. <laughs> you know what that's an allusion to, obviously, the Beatles. There's yuppie Jesus, who encourages us to reach our full potential, reach for the stars and buy a boat. <laughs> I'm not sure where that comes from, but probably the writer has uh, some reason for adding that on. And then, of course, there's spirituality. Jesus, who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, and doctrine, and would rather have people out in nature finding the God within while listen, listening to ambiguously spiritual music. There's the platitude Jesus, good for Christmas specials, greeting cards and bad sermons, inspiring people to believe in themselves. And then there is revolutionary Jesus who teaches us to rebel against the status quo, stick it to the man, and blame things on the, quote, system. And then there's boyfriend Jesus who wraps his arms around us as we sing about his intoxicating love and he helps us in our secret place. There's good example, Jesus, who shows us how to help people change the planet and become a better you. Well, in the midst of all of this confusion, and there is a lot of it around, a lot of those ideas are not as far-fetched as they seem, and as we consider that, in the midst of all of this confusion, in Hebrews chapter 1, we learn about the true Jesus, the, two, the, the true biblical person who is presented to us in the pages of Scripture. This is the Jesus who is Lord of all, and he is deserving of all of our devotion, all of our trust, all of our obedience. And so let's look at this. We'll start with verse 1. By the way, I, I would add this letter to the Hebrew Christians is primarily written to promote the greatness and the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all things. You will see that as we go verse to verse. So notice the way it begins in verse 1. God after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. Now in verse 1, what he's actually talking about here is our Old Testament. All of the the, the books and chapters in our Old Testament. God, he says, spoke to the fathers in the prophets, prophets such as Daniel, Malachi, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and on and on. The major and minor prophets, including Moses. He spoke to them, and they recorded for us what we have in the pages of the Old Testament. And of course, God spoke in a variety of ways as he, as he puts it. He spoke to some audibly. He spoke to others in dreams, in, in visions, through miracles, and in a, a variety of other ways. And so look at this again. Verse 2, after he makes that statement about the authority of the Old Testament, the way it came to us, he says, now, in these last days. Now, what we need to know here about this term, the last days refers to a time period that begins on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and this time period will continue until the great rapture event occurs where the church, the people of God, are caught up to be with the Lord and so we will ever be with the Lord from that point on. Uh, 
The church of Jesus Christ uh, is, is living presently in this church age that is also referred to as the last days. And the point of, of the writer here is that in these last days, God is exclusively speaking to us in his son. In the Old Testament, it was a little different, but now all revelation from God is coming to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. And then he continues, notice, whom he appointed. And by the way, watch how he stacks truth upon truth here about Jesus. He says, whom he appointed, uh, uh, he appointed Jesus, heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And so Jesus is the legal heir to all things. By the way, do you, uh, do you know who is the joint heir of all things? Yeah, the church. It says in Romans 8 that we as believers are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's amazing to try to plumb the depths of that. It, it would just stretch the mind out of proportion trying to imagine it. But we, the church, are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so he's saying Jesus is the legal heir of all things. And then he says, through whom also he made the world. And so Jesus created all things. It's interesting uh, when he talks about creation, he's going back in time. When he talks about becoming an heir to all things, he's going out into the future. And Jesus is in both places. He is, remember, according to scripture, the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. And then verse 3 says this, and he is the radiance of his glory, that is the glory of God the Father, and the exact representation of his nature. This means Jesus is just like the Father in his essential nature. And notice it says he upholds all things by the word of his power, which means that Jesus is the reality behind all things that exist. He is the force that holds all things together. You know, it's amazing as you look out into the universe, there is all of this motion. Everything is in motion. The planet, of course, is in motion. And our planet is just hanging in space. And everything is so fluid and everything is, is moving and it's held in place. Scientists are, are boggled at the idea of how this can be. But we know it's Jesus who holds all things uh, in place by the word of his power. And then in the next verse, or the next part of verse Three, this would be verse 3b. Jesus, or, or this tells us what Jesus did for people like us. People who have sinned against our holy creator. Notice what he says. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so when he made purification of sins, or a better translation is literally when he made cleansing of sin. Cleansing of sin. And of course, this is looking back to the event of the cross where Jesus took our place and died as our substitute. That's the heart of the gospel. Whenever people ask you, what do you mean by gospel? Well, gospel means good news, right? This is the good news. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, God in flesh, went to the cross, and on the cross, he became you. He became you. He became me. All of my sin was imputed to him when he was there as my substitute. And all of the judgment that I really deserve, that should fall on me, fell on him. 
as my substitute. And then he died and on the third day he was raised up from the grave. And in the resurrection, <clears throat> God the Father is saying to the whole world, I accept what my son accomplished in your behalf. I accept it, but now you too have to accept it. You have to agree to it and come to terms with what I have done and put your confidence and faith in this one who has died as your substitute. That's the essence of the message of the gospel. By the way, in uh, the middle of verse 3 there, the word purification or cleansing of sin, that, that's a very, very revealing statement. Because you will find in the Bible, there are many words for sin. For example, sin is falling short. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is also an act of rebellion. A sin is said to be a transgression against a, no law of, a known law of God. But sin in the Bible is also referred to as filth. Filth. Moral filth. Which is why it says here, he made a cleansing of sin. A purification of, of sin. Or look at it like this. <clears throat> sin is, is like taking a shovel of dirt and pouring it into our soul. It devalues us. It degrades us. It complicates us. It brings us down. And frankly, this is why you have in the Bible, uh, you have David and others, but in particular David, in Psalm 51, he prays using these words. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Look at this. Wash me thoroughly from my sin and iniquity and cleanse me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then he says in verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The two words, wash me, uh, the actual Hebrew word that he uses there literally means, oh Lord, scrub me clean. Scrub out my inner life. And folks, when you think about it, that's really what we all need. We need a holy scrubbing by God the Spirit at work in our lives. And that happens that happens when we open up our life to the message of the gospel and receive the virtue of salvation through the work of the Spirit. Now, he goes on here in verse 4 to stress this idea of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And what <clears throat> the writer is going to say here is that the supremacy of Christ extends even over all the angelic world, meaning over all the angels, both good and bad, over all the unseen world, the invisible world. And frankly, this is pretty important because back at this time, people were caught up in a lot of angelic superstition, uh, a lot like today. There are people in some circles today that uh, actually pray to angels. They make sacrifice to angels. They talk about getting a personal angelic spirit guide. They call on angels for blessing. And in some circles, that is completely out of hand. And so, in light of this superstition, here's what the writer says of Jesus. Having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And then he explains, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? <clears throat> Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son 
to me. Notice the contrast that he's making here. It's the difference between a servant and a son. Angels are servants, ministers of God, but Jesus is the son of God, the uniquely born son of God. And there's a lot of difference between those two categories. Angels are ministers, servants. Jesus is God's son. Look at verse 6. He continues. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And so notice when he brings the firstborn into the world, that's talking about Christmas, isn't it? Bethlehem. When Christ was born in the city of Bethlehem. And when that happened, the Father said, let all of the angels, when Jesus uh, began his condescension from glory to become confined to the womb of a woman, the Father said, let all the angels of God worship him. Now think about that for just a moment. We only worship those things that are superior to us. And that's the point that is being made here. Uh, you may recall there were angels surrounding the birth of Christ in a lot of uh, different ways. Uh, in almost every scene surrounding the birth of Christ, there was the presence and the work of, of angels. And really all through the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, you will see angels worshiping the person of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation where uh, the invisible world is unveiled and we are able to see things that are happening in that realm, angels are falling before God, before Jesus, giving him their worship. I remember once many years ago reading uh, John Bunyan. If you've never heard of John Bunyan, he's the guy who wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress. And he said this, if Jesus Christ is not God, then heaven is filled with idolaters. You, you get the point. He's validating the deity of Christ because all of the angels give him their worship. He is indeed God. And, you know, there are groups out there today, for example, Jehovah Witness groups, uh, Mormon groups, you know, they've bought into the idea that Jesus is just a higher uh, angelic personage. And, of course, that isn't true. Now, look at verse 7. He says, and of the angels, and by the way, this is a quote from Psalm 104, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. That's what angels are, by the way. They are ministers of God, servants of God. Verse 8, but of the Son, you see he's making a contrast, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Referring to Jesus here as God. God, a very God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, equal to the Father, equal to the Spirit. That's something we have to get fixed into our thinking because a lot of folks are missing this. Jesus is not just a created being. He is God. And here's a reference to that deity. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. This comes from Psalm 45, by the way, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. And then he says of Jesus in verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And that's true as you watch Jesus in the Gospels. He loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, hath anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. You may remember in the Gospels on three different occasions, God the Father spoke from heaven and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am 
well pleased, validating the son at, at crucial moments in his life and ministry. The father spoke, giving witness, validating the son to encourage him on. Verse 10 says, verse 10 says, you Lord, notice he's calling Jesus Lord here. You Lord in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands, the hands of, of Jesus. They will perish, but you remain. That's a great statement. They all will become old like a garment and as a mantle they will, you will roll them up like a garment they will be Change. The point that he's making here is that everything in the creation is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, thermo, the second law of thermodynamics is the idea that there is a degenerating quality to all of life. And it, I thought of this flower this morning. It's, it's degenerating, isn't it? It's falling apart. <laughs> If you would have seen it just a week ago, it was strong and vibrant, but this is a part of creation. It's fading. You, you younger folks, I used to look like you. <laughs> a lot of us who are older now, we used to look like you. We had all the energy. We were without the gray, without the wrinkles. We remember those days too. But there is a degenerating quality to all of life. That's what he's, he's contrasting here. However, notice what he goes on to say. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you, Jesus, are the same. And your years will not come to an end. He, he's describing really the immutability of Jesus. Immutability means that he never changes. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Malachi 3.6. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then look at this, verse 13. He continues making this contrast between the angelic world and the person of Christ. And here's what he says. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Now he does say that to Jesus, but he never said that to the angels. Verse 13 continues, but... To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And then he says, are they not, meaning the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's us. And there is angelic ministry going on in our lives, your life and mine. The Bible does talk about a guardian angel. We're not supposed to pray to him or whatever it is, uh, gender-wise. Uh, who knows? I, I have no idea how to explain that. But I do know that there is angelic support. I don't understand it, but God uses the world of angels to somehow play a role in our lives, that includes all of us who inherit salvation, who've come to faith in Jesus Christ. So the argument that he's making is that angels are merely servants of God in contrast to Jesus Christ, who is God of very God. And at the right time in human history, this God became a man. Why? In order to accomplish for us the purification, the cleansing of all of our sin. In other words, to remove the great sin bearer, barrier, I should say. Uh, read in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, which talks about the fact that there is a chasm or a, a great separation 
between us and God. And that separation is there because of sinfulness. But Jesus has removed that chasm or barrier. It's been taken out of the way by the finished work of Christ on the cross. That said, look at this next verse. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. He writes, for this very reason, we, we believers, must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, what is it that we have heard? We have heard about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that he is Lord above all. He is worthy of our devotion, of our obedience, of our worship, of our loyalty. And so he says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Notice the danger here, folks. It's possible that after hearing and relating and responding to the gospel, it's, it's possible that one can drift away from the centrality of Jesus Christ in one's life. I can tell you something, as a pastor, this is the most heartbreaking thing that one will go through. Realizing that there are people who had confidence in Jesus, who had crowned him Lord of their life, who had lived in harmony with his supremacy, and then the enemy slowly and subtly caused them to drift away from that position and posture of confidence and faith. That's the most heartbreaking thing that I think we have to deal with. But look at verse 2. This uh, comes as a warning, a further warning. He says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, if that's true, and it is, verse 3 says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, meaning through Jesus, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, meaning the apostles. God also testifying with them, the apostles, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so God the Holy Spirit was bearing witness, he's saying, through the apostles, validating their message about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus. And that's our New Testament. Everything in the New Testament is a validation of the supremacy of the Lord himself. Now, as I close this out, I want to take you back to these two warnings, if I may. Verse 1, warning number 1. He says, for this reason, we, we Christians, must pay closer, much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Since it is possible for people like us to drift away, I wonder what you are doing in your personal life to prevent that from happening. What, what is your strategy to stay in a posture of confidence and faith in Christ? I mean, the whole year is now uh, um, folding out before us. The year 2000. 2016. We're entering into that time frame and God has a great plan for all of us. What are your plans? What is your strategy so that you can protect yourself from drifting away from the centrality of Jesus in your life? What are you doing? Are you in the Word? Are you planning to get in the Word? Are you with God's people? Are you sharing the faith? Are you deepening your roots? Are you dealing with your stuff? 
We have to think about these things, folks. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention, he's saying. And then the second warning is there in verse 3. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The truth is, there is no escape. Because there is nowhere else to go. Where do you go for salvation if you don't get it or receive it from Jesus? To whom do you turn? Where do you go? Mohammed? He's in the, he's in the ground. He's dust. Buddha? To the Hindu gurus? Where do you go? You remember in John chapter 6, at the end of that chapter, the disciples were a little offended by some of the hard things that Jesus was saying. And so he began to thin out the crowd by telling them the truth. And so they began to drift away from Jesus. And he saw the disciples were stirred by that idea. So he turned to them and says, will you go away also? And do you remember what Peter said? It's as, if he, it's as if he was saying, Lord, we've thought about it. We have. But where can we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Where do you turn? Where do you go? There is nowhere else. Look at this in closing. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. My prayer for you today is that you will know that you are a part of the saved of God. That you have put your faith in Christ alone. That you've turned from your sin. You've said, oh Lord, I need you in my life. I'm trusting you. I believe in the work of the cross. I know that you were raised again from the dead. Come into my life. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me clean. Give me a pure heart, Lord. And let me live the kind of life that you've called me to live. I wonder if you've ever done that. If you haven't, you need to do it today. How will you escape if you neglect this offer? There is no escape. And to all of the saints of God in this room, what are you going to do now to protect yourself? You are up against a very clever adversary who will do everything he can in 2016 to trip you up. He's going to come at you from every door in your house. He'll come through the windows, down the chimney. He will come every imaginable way toward you, to trick you, to deceive you. How will you protect yourself from his strategy against you? You protect yourself by staying tight with God. You protect yourself by centering your life on the person of Jesus Christ you protect yourself by making decisions that are based on the Word of God and the glory of God. And when you do that, you can't go wrong. Let's pray.